Well, hey, you guys, welcome to Connected Bible Study. I'm Lori Joyner coming to you from the KDYMCA. And today we have a talk entitled A Model Prayer. And we're going to be talking from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 18. And I want to start off with a quote that I found as I uh, prepared for this talk. And it was this, the most important part of the Christian life is the part that only God sees. You know, we have to really think about that. Do we really believe that the most important part of our Christian life is the part that's done in secret with just us and him? Because I think that some people would think it's the opposite. No, it's what I'm doing for God. It's, it's what I'm out in the public doing. It's, it's, it's the mission trips. It's the things I'm doing at church. It's the public things. But I really like this quote because it puts in perspective that there needs to be a private part of our relationship with the Lord, a personal part. And really, Jesus has been making this clear as he taught repeatedly throughout the Sermon on the Mount so far that if you only do your acts of righteousness, such as giving to the needy or praying to be seen or heard by others, you will receive a reward. But the reward is the applause and the praise of man, of others, but not of God. Only when our motivation for giving or a motivation for praying is unto the Lord are we rewarded with eternal rewards. And remember, those are the rewards that matter the most because they last the longest. They last for eternity. So this week, in this lesson, we are going to see that Jesus expands on this idea of prayer even more. He's going to give us a model prayer that's going to help us keep our priorities straight. And we're also going to talk a little bit about fasting. So let me pray and then we'll get started in these verses today. Lord Jesus, I just come to you and I just say thank you just for the privilege of studying, preparing, and teaching your word. And so, Lord, I pray that I could be a vessel, uh, a tool in your hand to encourage others with your scripture. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let's jump into our passage for today. We're going to read first of it, uh, part of it just for now. And it's Matthew chapter 6, verses uh, 9 through, I'm going to read through 15. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So let's break this down a little bit. And in your notes, you're going to see some blanks. And right off the bat, we see that Jesus gave his disciples a model prayer, commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. But it was not his prayer in the sense that he prayed it. It was his prayer in the sense that he taught it. He introduced this prayer as a model or a pattern on how to pray. You know, I love the fact that some theologians say that it should have been labeled the model prayer. Since Jesus was using this prayer as a pattern for his disciples to follow. See, many people misunderstand the Lord's prayer to be a prayer that we're supposed to recite word for word. Okay, that's a common misunderstanding. You may think that you are required to recite that prayer word for word. Some people treat the prayer like a magic formula. You know, that, that if they just say the words themselves, just the words to God themselves, then somehow it's going to have a specific power or some influence over God. But we're going to see when we peel back the layers of this prayer line by line, that this is a model. This is a pattern and it's a multi-layered prayer. Like the peels 
of an onion, the closer you look, the more remarkable this modern this model prayer is going to become. So Jesus begins the prayer with our Father. He says, this is how you should pray, our Father. So the first thing to note is that he doesn't say my Father. I mean, he is, but he doesn't teach his disciples to pray that way. It's not saying my Father. He's saying our Father. This is signaling to his followers to pray with the word our. We are part of a community. Okay? When we pray to God as our Father, we are joining our prayers with those around the world from every tribe, from every language, from every tongue, from every nation. I'm joining my prayers with theirs, with believers present and believers from the past. Yes, prayer is a personal act, but we are a part of something much bigger, something historic that, ex that spans every nation and every generation. He is our God. He is our father, just like he was Moses's father and Abraham's father and maybe some other family member you know's father that has passed away. And this is what prayer is. We are joining our voices with millions around the world and throughout history in prayer to our father. And then he says, our father. Okay, so let's talk about the word just father there. God spoke the world into existence. He holds all things together, but he's not distant. He's not aloof. He is not far. He is as close as a father. He loves you. He wants to hear from you. And he is a good, perfect father. He is well, this is the key to understanding Christianity, is that we talk to God as a father. That title of father sex sets Christianity apart, actually, from all other religions. God wants us to have a relationship with him like a father to a child. He wants us to feel free to come to him. Okay, He says in Jeremiah 33, 3, and I put that in your notes, call to me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so the wonderful thing is God's saying, Call to me, come to me, address me as Father. I want that type of relationship with you. And I understand that some of you have some issues with your worldly father with your father on earth, that it could hinder that thought. Maybe your father's not in your life or perhaps there is a brokenness there. And so there's confusion. And that's why the word of God is so important because we can come to this word and say, well, that hasn't been my experience. That hasn't been my experience with, with my you know, earthly father. And God's saying, I know. That's why I put this in here so that you could see that I know that was your experience, but this is what I want it to be. That's why God is so good to not make us wonder, but to write it down clearly. And so I love this fact that um, we have instant access to God at all times. Okay, it, prayer is a gift from God. You don't have to wait till Sundays. You don't have to wait till confession. You don't have to wait till you're on your knees somewhere. You have immediate and instant access to God. And, you know, when I think about a, a neat illustration of that, I put this picture in your outlines. It's the picture, and it's a famous picture, a couple of pictures, of young um, John Jr., JFK's son, playing in the Oval Office when his dad was president. So now you got to imagine, imagine that you get to go see the president. You get to walk in today and go see the president. And you're thinking, oh, what am I going to wear? You know, uh, uh, am I supposed to shake hands? Uh, do I wait for them to shake hands? Is the Secret Service going to take me down if I go to give them a hug? Like, like, like how, how is this going to be? And so you're nervous. Your palms are sweaty. Your knees are weak. They're heavy. Um, and you're just wondering, okay, do I, do I just make eye contact directly? And so they'd be entering into 
you know, the Oval Office with a little bit of fear, a little bit of, you know, respect, a little bit of timidity, but contrast that with little JFK Jr., right? His dad was the most powerful man in the world, but it was also his dad. So he could just walk into there just willy-nilly. Just, it, it, it didn't care who was standing in there. He's the child. He gets to walk right on in. And not only does he get to walk in, he plays. He plays under the desk. He plays. He, he, he talks with his dad. His dad's sitting there counting on his fingers with him. I just love it. We've got to understand that this is just an earthly picture of the type of relationship that God wants to have with you. You have that access to God. And I love the, the, the one where it's showing him at the big desk and he's got world things he's trying to deal with and things for the nation, but his little kid's poking his head outside the desk. Imagine that's God. He's dealing with huge things all over the earth and wars and all kinds of horrible things going on and his timing and so many people's prayers he's answering, but yet you still get to walk in there and rest and cast your anxiety upon him. I like that one pastor said, the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. A child <laughs> can wake up their parent no matter who they are, if they need to go potty or if they have a, you know, if they're thirsty in the middle of the night. So thinking of God as our father reminds us of our privileged access to his presence and what a gift prayer really is. It was given to you as a gift. Don't think of prayer as an obligation, my friends. Don't, I'm not praying enough. I should be praying more. It's such a chore. No, it's a gift that you have immediate access to God at all times. It is a gift. So let's walk through this, this prayer at just a very basic level at first, okay? Each line of this model prayer, our Father in heaven. Well, Jesus is clearly teaching whom to address our prayers to. When you pray, pray to God the Father. And then he lists three God-centered requests. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. They're rattled right one after the other. These are God-centered requests. It's telling us to, when it says hallowed be your name, to worship God and to praise him for who he is. It's extolling that God's name is holy and we worship him as holy. This is, if we needed another reason, this is why we do not blaspheme the Lord's name. We do not uh, uh, use the Lord's name in vain or in any careless way. We already know that from the Ten Commandments, but here it is again. God's name is holy. It should be treated differently. Okay? The phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's just a reminder for us when we start our prayers to start with God as the center, with his will as the center. Don't, don't jump into what you need and what you want. Jesus is teaching us a model, a pattern that, it, that it's God first. Okay? So we want God's plan and in our lives and in the world to unfold, not our own plan. And we're to pray for God's will to be done, not our own will. So just moving on briefly here, the remaining four petitions have to do with us. People-centered prayer requests, daily bread, forgiveness, help in temptation, deliverance from evil. Okay? Now, daily bread was an expression that reflected first century life. It reflects our life too, but really the first century life when they literally, the workers received their pay daily. And there's some jobs here that receive their pay daily. I think about my little boy um, babysits for my sister every week. Uh, he's getting paid cash on the spot every time. You know, there's not some payday that's going to happen at the end of the month. You know, that you're not going to get direct deposited that money when you're a babysitter. And there's other, you know, jobs like that. But it reminds us that we really live only one day at a time, my friends. I mean, you can plan for the future. You can plan a vacation. You can plan to go this, that, and the other. You can plan for tomorrow. But we truly live one day at a time. And each day, we should be thankful for any provision that God has sovereignly brought into our lives. Now, make no mistake. 
that asking God to provide for our needs does not free us from the responsibility to work. Okay, I love that 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Okay, so when there's people around you that are unwilling to work, the Bible says that they shall not eat. We cannot say, God, supply my needs, but I'm going to sit here and watch, you know, I'm going to binge watch some Netflix, some, yeah, some Netflix uh, <laughs> on TV. Then it goes on to say, forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And this just reminds us on a basic level to confess our sins to God, to turn from them, and to forgive others. We all know that our debt to the Lord is bigger than any debt somebody else owes us. So if we've been forgiven for our sins and saved from hell, we need to be able in God's strength to eventually forgive others. And the conclusion of the Lord's prayer and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil is a plea for help in achieving victory over sin and a request for protection from the devil. Okay, so that's just a basic run through of the Lord's prayer, this model prayer. This is a very face value understanding, but I want to pill the onion with you. I want you to see how truly remarkable this prayer is. So another way to look at the Lord's prayer is in relation to time. When we pray for daily bread, we are asking for our present immediate needs to be met. When we ask for forgiveness, we are bringing the past to God for his forgiving grace. Because when you ask forgiveness, you're asking God's forgiveness for something you already did. I mean, don't be asking forgiveness for something you're about to do. That would be a red flag, right? I mean, that would be a big stop. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me for my drunkenness tonight or, or my indebtedness tonight. I mean, let's not, let's not be doing that, okay? Typically, when you ask forgiveness for something, it's for something you already did. So you're bringing the past to God. When we ask for help in temptation... We're asking for future help. Oh, Lord, keep me from this path. Keep me from this. Lord, help me. Be, be there. Help me say no. Avert my eyes. Close my ears. In a way, we're praying it forward. We're putting, we're putting prayers to, to, the, to the future. So this way of looking at the Lord's prayer we are taught by, that we're taught by Jesus is to lay before him all of time. My past my present, and my future. So when you come to the Lord's Prayer next time, think about it in relationship to time. But my friends, what if I peel the onion again? What if we go even deeper? Another way to look at the Lord's Prayer is to see it through the lens of the Trinity. Remember, the Trinity is the three-in-one nature of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. Okay, so here's the breakdown. When we ask for bread to sustain our earthly lives, that request immediately brings to our thoughts God the Father. Okay, just, I mean, the moment I think about God the Father supplying my daily bread, I think about the Old Testament. I think about manna on the ground. In the Old Testament, God supplied manna. It was like flakes on the ground that they could scoop up off the ground and create a bread uh, product with it. God gave them manna each day as the Israelites escaped from Egypt and found themselves in the wilderness as they headed on slowly to the promised land. God supplied, God the Father supplied their daily need for food. Okay, when we ask for forgiveness, well, that request immediately directs our thoughts to God the Son. Because it's because of Jesus Christ 
whose death on the cross and blood shed for our lives enables those very sins to be forgiven. We would be dead in our sins was it not for the blood of Christ and our faith in him that forgives us of our sins. When we ask for help for future temptation, well, that request directs our thoughts to God, the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit that fills us and directs us and convicts us. It's, it's God's voice in our mind telling us, don't do that. Don't do that. It's, it's the Holy Spirit recalling to our minds scriptures that we've memorized to help us in our time of temptation. So are you beginning to see how remarkable this prayer really is? Now, a final way to look at the Lord's Prayer is in contrast with the empty prayers, prayers of the time. Okay, remember that in Matthew 6, 7, Jesus talked about don't be like the pagans who babble on and on and think that their long list of words will make a difference. Okay, that was my little paraphrase there. So they kept on babbling, repeating words, and they used many words because they thought, well, the more words I use, the more maybe God will do what I want him to do. But we can see in this model prayer, in contrast to that, that there's no needless repetition. And it's quite concise in its length, is it not? It's not a long prayer. It's pretty concise. So again, the Lord's Prayer is not a prayer. We are to mindlessly just recite back to God. Okay, It shouldn't be a rote routine. It's just an example. It's a model. It showed you the ingredients that can go into, into praying. Now, there's nothing wrong with memorizing it. There's nothing wrong with praying it to God. But, but my point is, mean it from your heart. But I gave you an extra handout today. I actually just typed out the Lord's Prayer. And I put some of the thoughts that I would probably, and I do, pray in between each line. So you can see on that handout that each line can have multiple bullet points underneath it. I could have added three or four blanks under each, each, of, each line of that. So let's talk just quickly about fasting. Fasting unto the Lord, Matthew 6, 16 and 18, where Jesus says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others their fasting. Truly, I tell you, they receive their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So we know that fasting just involves going without food for a period of time to engage in a spiritual discipline, a spiritual exercise. And usually it involves more prayer. So we got to understand that at this time, the Pharisees fasted each Monday and Thursday, okay? Um, but they did it in such a way that people knew they were fasting. Their purpose was, of course, to win the praise of men. But as a result, they lost God's blessing. Um, as with giving and praying, true fasting must be done in secret, Okay? It is between the believer and God to make ourselves look glum and tired and weak or seeking pity for fasting would destroy, would destroy the basic purpose of that spiritual discipline of fasting itself. So I want to tell you a little story to close. When I was about 26, fasting was a big deal. So about, about 25 years ago, fasting was a huge deal in Christendom. Two significant books had come out. I put these on your outline. One was called, um, uh, oh, what, what is it? It's on your outline. The yeah, The Coming Revival, um, Seeking God, uh, Praying and Fasting and Seeking God's Face. That was written by the director, the founder, and the president of Campus Crusade for Christ at the time, a man named Bill Bright. And I was on staff of that organization. Another book came out called The Hunger for God, just a couple of years later, by a man named John Piper. Big books. And so whole churches were fasting. Bill Bright himself did a 40-day fast. 
Other people were doing 40 day fast and their hearts were in the right place. They were, they were telling people, let's get serious. Let's seek the Lord. Even if it means not eating, we need, you know, help for our country and help for, you know, Christians and help for churches. I mean, their hearts were in the right place. So here I was, I was a new missionary on staff with crew. I had ingested both books and I decided, well, I guess I'm, I'm going to do a 40 day fast. And my church was doing a big 40 day fast. And they were saying to people, here's the dates and we want you to sign up to do a big 40 day fast. Okay. Now at that point in my life, I'd never fasted more than a couple of days. And even that was like totally difficult. So I was like, but you know what? God's with me. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do it. And so I looked at my calendar. I put the dates down and I began to tell people, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this 40 day fast. I'm going to do it with the church. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? It was, like, it was a conversation. It was a thing. Okay. So one time, and, 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 you know, it was the time I was leading up to this fast. I was at the YMCA in Waco, Texas, and I was on a treadmill. I don't get on a treadmill now unless I got a gun to my head. Okay. I, I cannot do that. But I was walking on a treadmill. Maybe I was running. Who knows what I was doing? It's so boring. I can't even stand it now. But, um, I was, you know, excited about my fast and I had told my friends about my fast and my church are going to do this fast. And God said to my heart, what if I don't want you to fast? Well, why, why not? I mean, it's a good thing. And I begin to have a conversation with God in my brain. I can tell you, I, I can see the TVs. I see the treadmills. I can see the room. And I was arguing with the Lord, but I, you know, what, what do you mean? Why, why wouldn't I? I mean, this is a good thing. And you know what I said to the Lord? I've already told everybody I'm going to do it. <laughs> do you know that I was going to do a 40 day fast and I had not even prayed to God about it? I mean, I was going to skip right over God and I was just going to do it. And I decided not to, obviously. Because my heart, other people's heart was in the right place. My heart was not. And part of it was just, I don't think I even understood. I wasn't trying to be a Pharisee. I wasn't trying to gain the applause of man. But in a way, that's what was happening. Because it really would have just been about doing this thing with my church and not really about the Lord. And so my, my point here is, is that we need to make sure, just like that quote says on your, on your outline, that there needs to be something, uh, well, it says the most important part of the Christian life is the part that only God sees. We need to make sure that when we're praying and fasting and giving or any other thing you're doing, it's okay if other people notice, but our hearts got to be in the right place. We need to make sure that we don't do good works or things for God without God himself. We can fool a crowd of human spectators in the public arena, but God knows the truth of our heart. Let me pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this clear word in scripture that you beckon us to you as a child to a father. And that there needs to be a private part of our relationship with you. That not everything is for show. Not everything is public, even if it's in the right place. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just crack open our hearts. Show each one of us where, just like me in the 40-day fasting, where we might have drifted. or We might have gotten a little off course. Father, I pray that you would burn away the chaff in our life, burn away the things in our lives that um, are not solely sold out to you purely 100%. We want to live to please you, our audience of one. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.